so that you guys can I floating meeting controls. Okay, cool. All right. All right, so welcome everyone to the History of Diving Museum. We today have Dr. David Schiffman, author of Why Sharks Matter, and he's going to be telling us all about his work in shark conservation, and I will let him go ahead and take that away. Great. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you all for coming out today. I'm excited to be back in the Keys. I did uh, used to live here. Um, I now live and work in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit of my background before I get into what I do today and talk a little bit about what you're all here to see, which is sharks. So I did spend seven summers in the Lower Keys down at Sea Camp on Big Pine. I was a camper there, and then later I was a science instructor there. I taught the shark biology class. I was just back here this past weekend. We had a celebration of life for one of the founders who passed away this summer. So it's been very nice to be back in the Keys, and I was happy to get to arrange this on the way out. I also spent a further six years in South Florida getting my PhD at the University of Miami. I have my no-name pub shirt and everything, so I'm almost an authentic Keysian here. Now I live and work in the Washington, D.C. area, where I am what's called an interdisciplinary marine conservation biologist. I'm going to break all of that down so you get a sense of where I'm coming from before I get into the good stuff here. Marine conservation biology is a little different from the marine biology that you might be more familiar with. It means I'm not just studying the fish. I'm studying the, the uh, I'm studying the, not just studying where the fish go or what do the fish eat or things like that, but explicitly trying to use that to understand how to save endangered species from extinction. So it's the difference between where does the sea turtle go with the marine biology, where does the sea turtle go relative to where all of its threats are and how we can protect them uh, is marine conservation biology. So interdisciplinary, that means I don't just study the fish, I study the human side. I study the laws, I study the economics, I study what do people know, what do people want, what do people fear. And all in all, this means that I approach the study of science and the writing about science from a different perspective from some scientists you may be familiar with. And it also means that every day is a little bit different, which I love. Um, some days I'm spending on, on a boat, um, in South Florida, tagging sharks. I still have a lot of active research happening in Biscayne Bay. Uh, Eagle-eyed viewers here will see that that boat that we used to work on, it was based right here in Isla Mirada. Uh, it means some days I'm spending speaking with policymakers in the Washington DC area. Um, I also was involved in getting some laws changed about recreational shark fishing right here in Florida. Um, and it means some days I spend dressing up like an idiot and speaking at schools and museums and things like that, which I'm doing a lot of lately, and that's my favorite thing. I am also very active on social media. I'm one of the most followed scientists in the world. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. All of that is at Why Sharks Matter. So if you think of a question that you want to ask me in a few weeks or whatever, or if you want to learn more about this and how you can get involved, uh, those are all great ways to keep in touch with so I've loved sharks for a really, really long time. And today, I want to talk to you a little bit about why I love sharks so much and what, why they've held my attention for my whole life and what I've learned from a career studying them and a lifetime of being obsessed with them. And in doing so, I want to introduce to you some of the key themes of my new book, Why Sharks Matter. I'll note that the museum store does have some copies available for sale. Very grateful to them for that. Some of you nerds already bought copies before the talk, so perfect. Uh, and after, right after, if you want to get one, I'm happy to sign and personalize it for you. Um, that's actually me at Big Pine Key. Uh, I'm 15 years old in that photo, uh, taking the shark biology class that I later taught at Sea Camp. And following the conclusion of this talk, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, including those of you watching from Zoom, uh, from the comfort of your homes. Uh, I will have Julia coordinate those questions because I can't see them from here, but anything that anyone wants to know about sharks or marine biology or ocean conservation or my career or the book or anything like that, anything you want to know, I do an Ask Me Anything on social media every week. There is no question you have that I've never heard before. There are some weird questions out there. You all seem like a lovely normal group, so I'm sure they will be great <laughs> questions. Uh, I just ask that you hold that to the end of the talk, please. So I grew up I, I'm not so lucky of, as y'all to get to live so close to the ocean on both sides of the highway here. I grew up in Pittsburgh, uh, pretty far from the ocean. It's a great town, but it's not a great place to do marine biology. 
uh, we calculated when researching this book that my childhood home was 381.2 miles away from the nearest coastline. So how did I fall in love with sharks living in a place like that? Well, I actually know a lot of marine biologists who come from the Midwest of the immediate research team that I work with. We have two from Indiana, one from Illinois, one from Ohio and me. Uh, there's something about the ocean when you don't see it every day that it's extra magical in your imagination. But places like this, the, uh, science museums and ocean museums and zoos and aquariums are a big part of why I, why I fell in love with sharks. This is me at the Pittsburgh Zoo. That's my younger brother um, about 35 years ago. And the very first stop, y'all are stop number 29 on my book tour, but the very first stop was the Pittsburgh Zoo. They set up the same talk that you're seeing here in front of the shark tank where I saw the first sharks when I was a little kid. So this whole trip has been a real full circle thing for me, especially just being at Sea Camp this past weekend. And don't worry too much about the caution wet floor sign next to the 600,000 gallon tank full of sharks. They assured me it's probably fine. <laughs> so one of the reasons why I love sharks so much is because they're so weird and wonderful and fascinating and different from so many other living things that are out there. And that starts on the inside. That starts with their skeletons. I wanna demonstrate this to you here. So I want everyone to do something for me. Hold your arm in front of your face, pick a point about halfway between your wrist and your elbow and try to bend your arm. Hopefully you can't bend your arm there. <laughs> now crinkle your ears, crinkle your nose. You feel how much more flexible that is? That's bone, that's what our skeletons are made of. That's cartilage. Sharks and their relatives, the skates, the rays, and the chimeras, their skeletons are made out of cartilage entirely. They don't have any bones. It's lighter than bone, it's more flexible than bone, it heals faster than bone, but it's not as strong. But when you live in the water, you don't need it to be as strong because the buoyant support of the water keeps your body intact, which is why some large sharks being dragged out of the water, it's extra traumatic for them. Um, so the sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras are the cartilaginous fishes. Yes, fishes is a proper, proper plural when you're talking about more than one species of fish. Sharks also have a whole other way of perceiving the world that we don't have at all. I don't just mean they can smell better than we can, though they can. I don't just mean they can hear better than we can, though they can. I mean that they have a whole other way of perceiving the world that we don't have at all they can sense electromagnetic fields. And let me tell you why that might be helpful if you're a shark. You have a prey animal that's hiding under the sand or hiding under the mud, and you can't see it or smell it or hear it, you go hungry. Sharks can tell it's there because they can sense the electricity given off by its beating heart. I think that's incredible. What must that be like? What must that feel like? Uh, they also use this electromagnetic sense to navigate in the open ocean. People ask me all the time, I look at these crazy migrations on the Shark Packer website. We're all that good stuff. And the shark goes from this one beach out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, a thousand miles from anywhere, and then goes back to the exact same beach. How does it know where it's going? Is it following the Earth's magnetic field? So this discovery was made uh, in the 1960s and 70s by a guy named Ad Kalmin, pictured there. He just died in January of this year. Um, and I got to write about his life and scientific legacy for American Scientist magazine. Um, it's in the May issue and it's freely available online if you want to learn more about this issue. This was one of the more powerful things I've ever gotten to write. It was an exciting thing, but sad. So most of you, especially living here in the Keys where sharks are part of the culture, part of, on the news a lot, we could probably, I bet we could probably name 25 species of sharks between the people in this room. There are 536 known species of sharks. And there is a new species of shark, skate, ray, or chimera, the cartilaginous fishes, discovered somewhere in the world every two weeks. And that's been true for the last 15 years and shows no signs of slowing down. So sharks come in just this absolutely amazing diversity of shapes and colors and behaviors and ecologies. Uh, there's something for everyone. The US Navy SEALs have a saying that if you wanna know if there are sharks in the water near you, you dip your finger in the water and you taste it. And if it's salty, that means you're in the ocean and there are probably sharks near you. And that's true, but it's incomplete because they also live in rivers. Uh, that some shark species live under Arctic ice. Some shark species living, live in the deep sea where it's so dark that light never reaches. Just an, an incredibly biodiverse group. I wanna highlight some of my favorite weirdos for you here, just to give you a sense 
of how biodiversity is doing this. This in the lower right, that's the American pocket chart. It is not called that because it's small enough to fit in your pocket, though it is on this TV screen, it's just about actual size. It's called that because of this weird pocket of flesh behind its eye that's full of glow-in-the-dark liquid that it can squirt on command to startle away predators. That, in the lower left, is the mega mouth shark. There's a few reasons why I love the mega mouth shark. One is how it was discovered. It was discovered in the 1970s off Hawaii when a US naval vessel hit one, not with the boat, but with their anchor chain. If they had deployed that anchor 30 seconds sooner or 30 seconds later, it would have been a decade before scientists knew that these deep sea weirdos existed. And this is one of the largest species of sharks. They can get over 20 feet long. They also have glow in the dark gums. They live in the deep sea where there's no light and they biofluoresce on their gums. And that means prey animals that are not used to seeing the light uh, will go investigate and say, what is that? And they swim right into their mouths. And that is snack time goals right there. I also love their scientific name. Most scientific names translate to something like the gray bird with the brown spot on its head. Descriptive, but not exactly evo evocative. This is Megacosmopelagios, the giant mouth of the deep. By science standards, that's poetry. This is an animal that I've been relating to more and more since about March 2020, and I think many of you will agree once you learn more about them. You think that you typically think of sharks as being fast, powerful, athletic. Uh, the angular rough shark is the exact opposite of that. It is the couch potato of the ocean. So I've been relating to them more and more the last few years. <laughs> Here are some shark species found in and around South Florida. Uh, this is a slide I made for my PhD defense to just show these are the species that I got to work with during my PhD. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with some of these. You may not have seen a baby tiger shark. Uh, but their stripes are so vibrant when they're little, I love them. Uh, so there are lots of shark species found in and around South Florida and the Keys. So sharks are also have these absolutely incredible behaviors. Sorry, minimize this. Um, they have these absolutely incredible behaviors. Lots of animals can hyperextend their jaws in front of their face. Snakes famously do this, but nothing does it as far or as fast as the goblin shark. That video is slowed down 100 times so you can see what's happening in it. That video in the upper right is not slowed down. You're looking at the cruising speed of the adult Greenland shark, which is the slowest moving large animal in the ocean, but they are in no particular hurry because they can live to be over 400 years old, the longest living vertebrate animal on earth. They're not considered reproductively mature adults till they're in their late 160s, which is a very long time to be going through puberty. They also eat polar bears, oh. right? <laughs> I, was, I was interviewed about the book on Science Friday on National Public Radio, and I apparently crashed the WNYC work slack. That's when I said that everyone who was listening just went, wait, what, they eat polar bears? That's crazy, and it crashed the slack for the whole NPR statement. Uh, that's a thresher shark. Their tails can be as long as the rest of their body combined. And until 2013, when a scuba diver filmed this in Indonesia, no one knew what they used that for. It's sort of unwieldy for swimming. But no, they bend it back up and they whip it. And it makes a shockwave underwater that knocks prey animals unconscious that they can that go and munch on. People often ask me, what do hammerheads use the hammers for? Part of it is extra surface area for that electric sense. You'll often see them sweeping their head over the sand uh, much like someone at the beach with a metal detector, basically the same purpose. Um, sorry. Uh, but they also use it, like what you see here, to pin flat animals like stingrays to the sea floor so they can munch on them. This is a kite fin shark. It is the largest of the shark species whose whole bodies can glow in the dark. But there are, in fact, a lot of shark species whose whole bodies can glow in the dark. And there's a whole family of them called the lantern sharks. My favorite lantern shark is the ninja lantern shark. And, I, and the reason why it's called that is because my friend and colleague, Vicky Vasquez, who discovered it, found, discovered it right around Thanksgiving. And it was home with her family and everyone was talking about what's new at school, what's new at work. And she said, I discovered a new species of shark and I get to name it. And her young cousin runs in the room and says, ninjas are cool, call it the ninja shark. So she did. 
where do baby sharks come from? I'm sorry, in, the, in 2022, you cannot attend a shark talk without seeing at least one baby shark joke. I don't make the rules. But where baby sharks come from is also incredibly biodiverse and fascinating. Some shark species give live births. Right here, you're seeing 11 shark being born. Um, and as soon as that shark is born, it just has to be a miniature shark and take care of itself immediately. The sharks have no parental care of any kind. Some sharks, and this is actually a skate, a shark relative, lay eggs. You may have heard of mermaid's purses. You're looking at a mermaid's purse when it still has something in it here. Some sharks have a weird mix of this that's only found in sharks, where the animals hatch within eggs inside the mother and then develop as if live birth the last few weeks. Some sharks have something called multiple paternity. That occurs when a female mates with multiple males in the same mating season, gets pregnant by several of them at once, and gives birth to a litter of half siblings, the same mother but different fathers. Some sharks mate and then realize, you know what, now is not a great time for me to get pregnant, but I went through all the trouble of mating, so let's just store this sperm and then get pregnant at a time of my choosing. The record for that is just under four years of, store, of the female shark storing sperm in her body until the time was right and then become, choosing to become pregnant. Some sharks, um, can decide now is a great time for me to be pregnant, but there's not a suitable daddy shark around. So they just become pregnant. And instead of the babies being a mix of the DNA of mom and dad, it's exact clones of the mom. So incredible biodiversity of reproductive strategies here too. So sharks are absolutely incredible. But when most people think about sharks, you think about sharks as being a threat to humans, as sharks being dangerous uh, to, uh, or to you and your family. There, every once in a while, accidents do happen. Every once in a while, someone is injured. Every once in a while, someone is even killed. But this is astronomically unlikely. So why do we think about this so much? Part of it is breathless, fear-mongering media coverage. One of my favorite statistics about this is a colleague of mine looked at uh, how shark attacks, sarcastic air quotes, shark attacks, were covered in the international press. And in 38% of cases where there was a news story about a shark attack in Australia, the shark did not physically touch the human at all. It swam near them in a way the person reported as threatening. And that is headline news everywhere in the world, tourists attacked by shark. But part of the reason is this movie, Jaws. This movie changed the world in a, a lot in a lot of ways and changed how people think about sharks. Before Jaws, most people didn't think about sharks very much. Scuba divers did, fishermen did, surfers did, but most people just going to the beach didn't really think about it. We actually have something in the, the public policy literature called the Jaws effect, which describes how a, a fictional portrayal of a real world issue influences how real world people really think about that issue. Peter Benchley, who wrote the book that Jaws is based on, was so horrified by how, he changed, how, how this led to persecution of sharks <coughs> that he devoted much of the rest of his life to shark conservation efforts. And to honor that, remember that ninja lantern shark that I mentioned earlier? Its scientific name is Benchley Eye to honor his commitment to shark conservation. So when I say that shark bites are astronomically unlikely, I just want to highlight some of the things that kill more people than sharks in a typical year. Uh, my one of my favorite statistics about this is that more people are bitten by other people on the New York City subway system every year than are bitten by sharks in the whole world. And I can always tell who's been to New York City by how people react to that statistic. Either what are you talking about or, yeah, I can see it. Uh, flower pots falling on your head from above while you walk down the street kill more people than sharks do in a typical year. As a social media guy, I love this one. More people die falling off cliffs while trying to take selfies of the beautiful scenery behind them than are killed by sharks. Uh, this one is apparently not true anymore. I got a, a weirdly hostile phone call a few weeks ago that I included this statistic in my book that vending machines kill more people than sharks. And apparently that's not true anymore. During the Obama administration, OSHA instituted some new rules about vending machine safety, and these things are no longer the death traps that they used to be. But now I keep this in out of spite. Um, but for the record, I don't know anyone who's ever been injured by a shark. I do know two people who have been seriously injured by vending machines. So sharks are, sharks are not only not really a threat to you, uh, they're not only not bad, but they're actively good. They help keep the food web in balance. And when we're talking about the ocean, this is a food web that billions with a B of humans depend on for food security and tens of millions of humans depend on 
for jobs, not to mention recreation and culture and things like that. We want the ocean food web to be healthy. And that starts with making sure that the top of the food chain is healthy. There's something in ecology called top-down control. Um, that basically means that top predators have a disproportionate influence on the health of the food web. This is a food web diagram. Don't worry if you can't read this, I'll walk you through it here. Every box represents a fish species or a bird or a marine mammal or an invertebrate or something found off Cape Cod. And the arrows are ecological interactions between them. This eats this, this competes with this for space, et cetera. If I were to pull one thread out of that web, the web would probably be okay. If I were to pull five, I'd start to get a little nervous. If I were to pull 10, 20, 30 threads out of here, we're talking about the collapse of an ecosystem and all the people that depend on it. That's very bad. We don't want that to happen. And again, because of top-down control, predators eating prey has a disproportionate impact. So we especially want the top of this food web to be healthy. This is a really cool uh, thing. Let me walk you through this diagram. Uh, there's something called fear ecology. I think it's one of the most interesting things happening in behavioral ecology space right now. It basically says that the mere presence or even possible presence of a predator influences the behavior of prey, possibly more than eating the prey does. Um, if you, so pr prey animals will avoid areas where predators might be, and enough prey animals avoiding areas or preferentially concentrating in one area has a huge impact on the ecosystem. So now let me orient you to this picture. This is a seagrass bed, the dark green is seagrass. The dots are coral heads, coral bombies in Australia, and the white is sand. That is the distance that fish are, are comfortable leaving the coral head to graze. And it makes this remarkable effect that is another example of scientific poetry. This paper is called A Halo of Fear Visible from Space. So I interviewed, as part of my postdoc research, and I cover some of this in the book, uh, I interviewed all of the shark conservation activists in the English-speaking world. And I asked them, among other things, when you tell people we need to save the sharks, what argument do you use to, to, make, to claim that? And this, one, this argument, sharks are important, and when we lose sharks, it's bad for the ecosystem. Number one reason by far, more than all the other reasons combined. So sharks are amazing, fascinating animals. They're not a threat to you or your family. In fact, we are better off with sharks than we are without them because of the ecosystem services that they provide. But unfortunately, many species of sharks face very, very, very serious conservation challenges. Uh, it's so bad and it's gotten worse so fast that this infographic from 2015 is already out of date. It's already worse than this. This says that a quarter of all known species of sharks and their relatives escapes the rays and the chimeras are threatened with extinction. It's now closer to a third. And that is in less than 10 years, it's gotten that much worse. The number one threat by far is us. It's humans, it's unsustainable fishing practices over fishing. So many people have heard of shark fin soup and shark finning and the shark fin trade as a threat to sharks. It is a threat. It is not the only threat, it is not the biggest threat, and it is a threat that has been declining for the last few decades. In the same time period, the shark meat trade has, gro has grown astronomically. Um, so whenever I say this, the shark fin trade is going down, I always have someone saying, oh, whew, that's the threat I've heard of, sharks are safe now. I just said on the last slide that things have gotten worse since 2015, and that is because of the enormous growth of the shark meat trade. I'll also note, that I have talked to some folks in the ocean conservation community who have told me that a bowl of shark fin soup, that's evil, that's vile, that's repugnant, that's repulsive. That, that is how normal people eat fish. So that's fine. So from a conservation perspective, that makes no sense. Either way, it's a dead shark. It's also super racist and not especially helpful. You can be forgiven for not having heard of the shark meat trade as a threat to some species of sharks. This is an analysis that we did of how shark conservation was covered in the English speaking media over the last decade. Shark finning in the shark fin trade was covered in six and a half times as many articles as the shark meat trade, even though the shark meat trade is a larger threat that is expanding more rapidly. That is not great news for public understanding of these issues. So the good news is this is not a lost cause. We know 
what can be done to help sharks. We know what works, we know when it works, we know what doesn't work and when it doesn't work. We know what we need to make something work. We know when we need your help to make it work. And this was in fact a big part of the reason why I wanted to write my new book, Why Sharks Matter, because there's never been a book that has covered this topic, the specific laws and policies and management regulations and who makes the choices and when do you get input and what should you pay attention to if you wanna help. That's it. There's never been a book that's tried to cover that for people that aren't law students or graduate students in the sciences. You often get books of, about shark conservation um, that are written by people in the scuba community. And all it says is shark finning is bad. Don't eat shark fin soup and you'll save the ocean. I'm going to bet that most of y'all in this room aren't eating shark fin soup on the regular to begin with. So that is potentially not super actionable advice. So this idea that there are a lot of things that we can do to save sharks that are not things that most people have heard of is a big thing that I wanted to cover in the book. So most Westerners would probably agree that anchovies are a natural resource to be sustainably exploited. Whereas the great whales, those are not, those are wilderness, those should be preserved, those are wildlife. And sharks sort of fall awkwardly in the middle here with some people feeling very strongly that they're on one side and some people feeling very strongly that they're on the other side. And this leads to some very intense conversations. Uh, but for me, as someone who studies the human side of ocean conservation issues, it's a fascinating area for, of study. Uh, it's worth noting that I surveyed all the shark scientists as part of my PhD work, and we found that 90% of shark scientists around the world think that the goal of shark conservation, the problem is unsustainable overfishing, let's make fishing more sustainable. That 90% of them prefer that rather than we should ban all fishing, we should ban all trade in shark fins. Um, and if you've never heard that before and you consider yourself fairly well plugged into ocean conservation issues, that you've never heard of 90% of, or a solution that 90% of experts support, I would encourage you to rethink where you're getting some of your information from. And finally, the last theme of the book, and something if any of you follow me on social media at Why Sharks Matter already, you've seen me rant about a lot, is this idea that wanting to help is great and trying to help is great, but wanting to help and trying to help are not the same thing as actually helping. It matters what we do to help sharks. Some things don't work. Some things, some things waste everybody's time and energy and don't actually help. Some things make the problem worse. It matters what we do. There are lots of people who are well-intentioned but not especially well-informed about what the threats to shark populations are or what the policy solutions are. There are also lots of people who are unscrupulous and exploit that. They know that there are people who want help but don't know how. Um, and they might say things like, oh, you can't trust the mainstream environmentalists. You can't trust the scientists. Give me all your money and we'll save the ocean together. Um, and there are some scam artists in the scuba community who take advantage of this stuff. I wanna give you a couple of humorous examples of this. Wanting to help is not the same thing as helping. Uh, some of you may have seen this. There is a growing movement among scuba divers, uh, among some members of the scuba community, where they hug sharks and they ride sharks and they kiss sharks. They kiss sharks on the face with their face, the part of the shark that has the teeth, what we technically call the bitey end of the shark. They put it on their face and they say, I'm helping. I'm doing science, I'm doing conservation, I'm doing education. I don't know what the heck is happening in this photo, but it's not science, it's not conservation, it's not education. Um, and this is a particular thing that drives me nuts. How many of you have ever seen a petition like this on Facebook? If you're on Facebook, you've seen change.org petitions probably. Change.org bills itself as anyone can save the world, anyone can change the world, anyone can make their own petition. Uh, the problem with anyone can make their own petition is a lot of people who don't have a clue what they're talking about make petitions and more dramatic flashy sounding ones go viral more. Um, this is a petition from April of this year to ban the practice of shark finning in the state of Florida. It got 60,000, 60,000 signatures. And not one of those 60,000 people, nor the person who made the petition, was apparently aware that we banned shark finning in Florida in 1993. This is a petition that cannot possibly do anything to help sharks. All it can do is confuse people about what the threats are and what the solutions to those threats are. And it also collects 60,000 emails for change.org, which is the reason they're so restricted. I also wanna highlight uh, some issues uh, that come up with the shark scuba community. 
You may have heard the phrase, because of scuba diving with sharks, uh, sharks are worth more alive than dead. The scuba wildlife tourism is gonna be what saves the sharks. And yeah, sometimes in some cases, maybe with some pretty big caveats. I wanna highlight some issues with this argument. Uh, a lot of times, the, the sharks that you get to go scuba diving with are not the most endangered sharks. Because critically endangered sharks, the ones that most need our help, are super rarely seen, which means you can't really build a scuba business around seeing them. Often you see the, some of the big scuba operations, you often see bull sharks or Caribbean reef sharks or things like that. Not necessarily the species in the greatest need of conservation attention, though in some cases there are businesses built upon uh, uh, swimming with endangered species. It also matters who it's worth more alive to than it was worth dead to. The argument here is if, you, if a fisherman were to go out and kill a shark, they might get 75 or 100 bucks for that shark. But if that shark is alive on a reef, attracting scuba divers to the town, it'll generate more money over its lifetime than it would. Well, yeah, sure, in some cases that's true. But to whom? The Bahamas is the global epicenter of shark diving tourism. But many of the most profitable businesses there are run by Americans, not by the Bahamian fishermen who have lost out on this. Uh, there are some places where you can go scuba diving with sharks in the Bahamas where you'll never set foot in the Bahamas at all. You'll get on a liveaboard boat here in Florida, go across, and might not even, even see land in the Bahamas at all. And that, they do pay a tax, but that doesn't go to the same people. Um, there are, also, there are a variety of other issues with this. Whenever I call out that behavior of hugging sharks and riding sharks and things like that that I showed on the previous slide, uh, there's always somebody who says to me like, well, isn't that better than killing a shark for its fins? And I'm like, sure, but those are not the only two options available to us here. There are other things we could do such as respectful wildlife interaction. Um, so there are some, some major issues with this argument. It certainly is part of the solution in some places. Um, and there are also some wildlife tourism operators that are great. They're safe for humans, they're respectful of the wildlife, they raise money for conservation, they help scientists. They're absolutely great operators out there. There are also a lot of clowns. Um, so I just urge you to be careful with things like that. So back to my book here, uh, which I'll again note is for sale in the bookstore here uh, at, the, at the Diving Museum uh, lobby. And if you want to get a copy after this, I'm happy to sign and personalize it for you. So, there are a lot of shark books that are out there. I have three shelves of them at home and I don't have, I don't have all of them. I'm working on getting all of them. <laughs> but most of those books are so radically different in scope and approach to this. There's never been a book like this one before where I try to explain all of the science between uh, why we know sharks are important and how we know, all of the science that shows what the threats are and how we know, all of the different laws and management regulations uh, that are out there that can be used to help save sharks, as well as what you can do to help. It, for many of the organizations that you'll meet in the book or the scientists that you'll meet in the book, uh, it does contain information on how to follow them on social media. It does contain information on how to donate to them and learn more. And I've been absolutely thrilled with the reception this has gotten so far. As I mentioned earlier, I got interviewed on NPR Science Friday about this, which was a career highlight. That was just a blast. Uh, I was a featured review in the New York Times, which is amazing. I passed Jane Goodall on the Amazon Science Bestsellers list, which childhood me would absolutely not have believed. Oh, wow. And uh, adult me possibly had to run and vomit when I saw that. <laughs> so I've been absolutely thrilled at the reception so far. Uh, I want to note here that, again, this is stop number 29 on my international book tour. So thrilled to be here with you today to get to give a talk about this back in the Keys where so much of my professional development happened. Um, I, if any of you uh, watching in here live or, on, or watching over Zoom represent a group that's interested in having a talk, I can Zoom anywhere, I, I can talk to your school, I can talk to a library, never a charge for public schools or libraries. Um, you can just reach out, it's whysharksmatter at gmail. I'm, I'm very easy to find on that. Uh, so happy to, happy to chat about that further. Um, before I wrap up here and take your questions and then sign some books, uh, I have a few folks I want to thank. I want to thank the History of Diving Museum, especially Julia, who uh, manages social media here, among many other things, and helped set this up for me. I want to thank my family for always supporting this crazy dream of mine. I've wanted to be a marine biologist since I was four. My parents had no idea what that means, but they said, we support you, and they really did. 
Um, now my dad is retired. I'm driving to their house next there in Naples. And now, now that he's retired, he takes his golf buddies on shark research trips with me. So I feel like I finally made it. Uh, I'd like to thank my publisher, Johns Hopkins University Press, for giving me a lot of freedom to run with a, a very different idea for a shark club. Uh, to give you a sense of what I mean by that, this is a, a venerable academic publication. Um, and they, uh, I am responsible for a 129 year old venerable publication house having to have an all staff editorial meeting to decide what the house style is on how to capitalize Florida man. So had a very different uh, scope for uh, this type of book and what they're used to. I wanna thank friends and colleagues for years of fact-checking and proofreading and hearing my vision for this. And finally, I wanna extend a deep and sincere thanks to you guys. I'm right now having the time of my life traveling around the world talking about sharks. I could not do that if no one wanted to listen. So I'm very grateful to you. And I'm in a moment here. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has about any of this. But first, I want to tell a quick funny story about this picture. I was a sponsor of the Sigma Xi conference, basically a national science fair. And I had this ask me anything you want about sharks food set up. And it was not just for all the middle school science nerds from all over the country who could ask me questions. But we opened it up to the town. This was in Madison, Wisconsin. And all weekend, people came and asked me questions about sharks. It was awesome. But at one point I went up to go to the bathroom and I came back and there was a 10 year old boy sitting in that chair answering people's questions about sharks. <laughs> and I sat in Boston okay. for about 15 minutes and we got most of the answers, right? Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And if those of you on Zoom, Julia will relay those. What can I, what can I answer for folks in the, in the room first, please? Yeah, you know, that Luke just a couple of weeks ago. Yes. That little boy. Yeah. Uh, bull shark, is that correct? It was a bull shark? I, I think that's what the report I said. I saw the video the mother did. The water was crystal clear. It was this deep. Yeah. And there was people everywhere. What do you think happened there? I mean, it wasn't like the typical, you know, evening, dark water. Yeah. Dark what, yeah, you know, I am just not sure. I was actually just out at Lou yesterday morning, um, and I didn't see any sharks. We did see a beautiful eagle ray on a Goliath Hoover, but yeah. Some of yeah. the teenagers out there die that all the time, so they never saw a bull shark. Well, yeah, it's, it's bull shark coming in at two o'clock in there. Pretty yeah. strange stuff. So, with the generally speaking, with sharks biting people, it's such a rare occurrence that it's hard to make any sort of broad statistical patterns. But most of the bites, as you mentioned here, happen pretty close to shore uh, at dawn or dusk when someone's by themselves. Uh, it very rarely happens to snorkelers or divers. Um, and it very rarely happens in the middle of the day. So what's going on? I have no idea, but you're right, it's unusual. Are there, are there mm -hmm. different areas or more areas that are affected by the shark issues than others? Like, like You mean the, the, the shark, shark populations? Yes, shark yes. Yeah. yes, because you hear about the Chinese with the shark fin soup and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I don't really see that too much on our menus, mm -hmm. thank goodness, but are there certain areas where they're more endangered? Yes, there definitely are areas where they're more endangered than others. And a lot of, uh, a lot of North American fisheries do supply the global markets. Uh, so we're not the end, the end user base of the markets, but uh, we do, we're part of the supply. U.S. fisheries tend to be some of the most sustainable out there. Uh, but uh, I was actually just chatting with someone uh, right beforehand who popped in the museum to see me but wasn't able to stay for the talk. He was a, sh a shark fisherman um, in the Keys. But um, yes, there are definitely patterns. Uh, the Indo-Pacific, the Coral Triangle region is both the hot spot of biodiversity. Some of, there are more species there per square mile than just anywhere else, and also more endangered species per square mile than anywhere else. You'll see that pattern not just with sharks and rays, but also with corals, with several different families of fish, with things like that. Um, and it's a combination of factors. But um, Indonesia is is not a place you want to be living if you're a shark. India is not a place you want to be living if you're a shark. Um, parts of South America are pretty good. Um, so yeah, there are definitely geographic and cultural uh, and industrial patterns in that for sure. Please. So you've mentioned that you get all kinds of wild questions in your AMAs. Oh man. What's your favorite you've ever gotten? Yeah, so I had my, my book launch party. I live and work in Silver Spring, uh, which is where the NOAA Fisheries Headquarters is, uh, the headquarters of the US government agency that manages our fisheries. And I sort of put the word out there that I was going to do this, ask me anything at my book launch party and encouraged my colleagues to bring their hardest questions. And I, I, I raised my hand at the end and the first hand up is Carol Brewster Geis, 
uh, who if any of you work in the fishery sector may have heard that name, she manages all of US shark fisheries. She's a, she's a big deal. And she just has this evil demonic grin on her face. And I was just like, oh my God, what is about to happen? And she said, are you sure you want me to ask the hardest question? I can think of, oh my God, yes, fine. Um, and she said, I'm gonna ask you the hardest question I've ever been asked in my career. And I did not know the answer. And I'm curious what you think the answer is. Like, oh God, okay. And she said, she just got a phone call out of the blue ones where someone called and they said, I need to perform an exorcism. What species of shark should I use blood from in order to do this? To maximize the effectiveness of the exorcism. And so I, I, upon further reflection, I should have said angel shark. But what I said at the time was if you wanted to, to not, so, to not have a bad reaction with the holy water, which is fresh water, uh, you want a freshwater tolerant shark. So I said that the Glyphus river shark of the Indo Pacific. She was happy with that answer. <laughs> but I get I get weird questions. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a tough one to top. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty great answer. I, I, I was, I, she was she was impressed. Okay. Please. Um, just in relation to like the Luffy attack, which I thought was a strange one also. Yeah, it's definitely not what you usually hear about. Yeah, the and you know, like all the fish, it seemed a little strange, but I feel like we've noticed a few more of those attacks being bull sharks. I had a good friend attacked last week, mm -hmm. but he was spearfishing, so it made sense yeah. when that happened. Um, he did say that was a bull. The Luffy was a bull, and then we had an attack where some a snorkeler was just jumping off to do a tour, and they got bit, and it was a bull. Wow. So I'm thinking they obviously have a more aggressive nature, more curious, but I'm wondering if fishing pressures just in the keys locally are a factor? Maybe it's hard to say. So, so in some places, you definitely have seen that pattern where overfishing of a, a large predator species main prey leads to um, them seeking out other sources of prey and maybe going places they wouldn't normally go or trying to eat things they wouldn't normally eat. That doesn't seem to be what's happening here. But I don't know what it is, so yeah, it's hard. To, it's hard to shoot down any idea, and we know that does happen some places. Uh -huh. I ask you. So let's say you're out there, like the little boy about a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, he was just turned like 14. It was his birthday. You're out there lobstering in Key Largo, mm -hmm. and uh, he comes up the water. Hey, Dad, I got a lobster. He starts swimming through the boat. He gets nailed by a bull shark. Everybody's watching it. Wow. And um, of course, the lobsters make noise. But let's say you're out there swimming, maybe lobstering, whatever, and you see a bull shark coming by, you obviously have more experience than I do. What, what do you do? Yeah, so the, here's a, an answer that you're not going to be happy with. It's the bull shark that you don't see that you have to worry right. about. Right, it needs to come up in contrast. Yes, uh, they're they are very good at that. And in fact, when I, when I was 15, diving off Big Pine at Sea Camp, uh, we were, it was my first ever night dive. It was the Naui Master Diver Course. And you know, they tell, for those of you who are, are divers who've ever done night diving, they tell you, you shine the light down, not in front of you. Uh, you shine the light down. And just for a second, I shined the light in front of me and it illuminated a big hogfish. And right behind me, big bull that was apparently following us, uh, just whooshed by and took it. It didn't go for me, it took out the hogfish, but it was so close that I felt it swim by me. And man, I needed to change my bathing suit after that. But it's, uh, that, if I find that when I see a bull shark, it's usually just cruising. Uh, and every once in a while, I turn around and I see one that didn't want me to see it, then I, I'll, I'll get out of the water. Uh, I'll tell you, I don't spearfish. Uh, I, just get, I was just up in Cape Cod a few weeks ago giving a talk there, and somebody said, like, you're talking about how unlikely shark bites are and all that. Like, would you go in the water off the beach right here? And I said, nope. So I, it's an unlikely thing. Um, there's, there's, it's some of the advice that you get doesn't make a lot of sense about what to do. You may have heard, uh, if you're being bitten by a shark, punch it in the nose. Have you ever tried punching underwater? It's great. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Low impact exercise for senior citizen, but it's not great for much else. Uh, so yeah. So they start to get closer to you, get out of the water. Never a bad idea. If, I, if, if there's ever a, if there's ever a situation that you're feeling a little squirrely, uh, it does not hurt. You will not regret getting out of the water. You can always go snorkeling or spearfishing again another day. Is it yeah. true if they pull into a figure eight to come into the center of the eight? I've heard that. I don't know. Um, 
I, I'm not sure. There's a lot of sort of folk advice about there out there that isn't that there isn't data to back it up, which doesn't mean it's wrong. It might just be based on someone's experience. But I don't think that's been studied scientifically. My favorite piece of folk advice that's out there about this is if you see if you're at the beach and you see dolphins, it's safe to go in the water because sharks are afraid of dolphins. No, they're not. If you see dolphins, they're feeding on little fish, and I guarantee you there are sharks right under them feeding on the same fish. Uh, there's another another thing, example of like sort of a, a, an idea that was not informed by science. Let's say charitably, you may have seen there these wetsuits you can buy that are black and white horizontal stripes, and that's to make you look like a venomous sea snake, so the sharks won't eat you. Well, even if it does make you look like a venomous sea snake, tiger sharks eat sea snakes. So that is not. Uh, that there are cases when the engineers should talk to the biologists. Is what I'm saying. Do we have questions on the on the Zoom? We do. First question oh, yes. I wanted to ask is to the room. Does everyone yeah. who wanted a copy of the book for David to sign have one? Because we're getting some phone numbers, and I want to be all If anyone wants to go grab one, I'll sign it for you uh, before I hit the road here. But, Are you all still? Yeah. Does anyone want a book that doesn't already have one? No. Okay. okay I'll great. Know to go go yeah, with this please. one. All right. And I have some questions here on please. Zoom. This one is from Claudia. Her question is specifically, what are some actions we can engage in to help sharks? That is a great question. So the single most impactful thing that an individual consumer can do to help the ocean at all, including but not limited to sharks, is not support unsustainable fishing practices. Notice I did not say we all have to give up seafood entirely. Fishermen are evil, we all need to become vegan or the oceans are doomed, which you may have heard in recent sarcastic air quotes again, documentaries like Sea Spiracy on Netflix, which makes that argument. Uh, that's nonsense. But there are definitely some fishing practices that have environmental harms, including to sharks, uh, and not supporting those is a huge thing. So supporting sustainable fishing practices, local seafood is great. You're blessed to live somewhere like here where there's so much delicious local seafood. I had blackened hogfish for lunch over at Mangrove Mites. Man, I'm going to be dreaming about that sandwich. Uh, but uh, su supporting sustainable fishing practices is great. Another great thing you can do is uh, donate time or money to reputable environmental nonprofits while not supporting the, the crazy people. My book gives some guidance on some great nonprofits as well as some ones to be on the lookout for. Um, the, and following experts on social media, if you're a social media person, can be great. If you follow me, again, at Why Sharks Matter, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, I share stuff from all of my colleagues all the time. Uh, here's the cool thing that my friends found uh, about what this species of shark does all over the world. Here's a cool, here's a way that you can help. Um, that's all vetted and David and all that good stuff. So lot, there are lots of things you can do to help for sure. Okay. I do want to say Mangrove Mike's has a great hogfish hollandaise as well. <laughs> <laughs> my other question is from yeah. Warren. Uh -huh. How do we address the media's use of the ridiculous term shark infested waters? Oh my God. So I have found that in the last maybe three years, I have seen more memes on the internet making fun of this idea of shark infested waters than I have seen actual usage of the term. So I think just mockery has helped. Uh, but like they live there, that's their home. You also see um, a lot of descriptions all the time like shark near the beach. Like, yeah, near the beach is the water. That's where fish live. If there's a beach, if you see a beach uh, walking down uh, Duval Street on Key West, give me a call. But if it's in the water, that's where they're supposed to be. Uh, but it's a great question. I find that mockery helps uh, with a lot of cultural, cultural change issues. And yes, another one in the room, please. How do you personally, or from what you've seen as a scientist, how do you think the warmer waters are affecting the shark's behavior? That's a great question. I was actually part of a research team that found the first ever evidence for what's called a climate change induced range shift in, in sharks, in large dangerous, large dangerous sharks. It was actually bulls. So what that means is their, their current habitat is now too hot. So they can or they can go somewhere else. And where we are on the, in the northern hemisphere, going somewhere else means going north. Uh, where it's now where it's now what the temperature used to be here and we found this with bull sharks the, the northern extent of bull shark nursery areas where baby bull sharks bull shark are born used to be about jacksonville and now it's up to the outer banks prior to about 2005 there's a shark survey in the outer banks that's been running since the late 60s never once not one time ever did they see a baby bull shark and now we get them all the time 
And what's happened in that time, the water temperature off the Outer Banks is now what it was in the 1960s off Jacksonville. Um, a lot of times, sharks just sort of move. Do you think it's it's playing a change in maybe the attacks as well? Possibly. So we are expecting that uh, with minor bites. Um, so that you may have seen those every year, there's that breathless media coverage of, oh my God, there's hundreds of black sharks off Fort Lauderdale um, from, the from the helicopter footage. Um, those are moving north and they're moving north into murkier waters. And so those are little sharks that are feeding in the shallows and can't see very well. Uh, and that means that if you're you know, standing among the fish that they're hunting, it's, that's, not a, that's not a place where I would stand. Right. So maybe, yeah, we don't know a lot of what happens. Yes, please. Isn't that a low matter coming out of our beach? I just noticed a bunch of baby uh, blackheads there. Cool. And some uh, scalp heads. Uh -huh. Are those live births or how? Uh, yes, they are. They are? So yeah, live births. Drops them and then, then they leaves just, and they may never see them again. Okay. Yeah. yeah so there are cool. lots of yeah. shark species use what's called a nursery area which is a shallow area of the ocean where there's lots of baby fish to eat and not a lot of predators until they grow up and they're big enough to take care of themselves in the deep blue sea. And my research team actually discovered the first ever nursery area for great hammerhead sharks in the United States. And it is within sight of the lights of Miami. You think of these places of critical habitat for endangered species as being like isolated, pristine, the middle of nowhere. This is, I am nobody's athlete, especially lately, uh, and I could swim from this nursery area to this type of beach with no problem. And it was totally an accident. <laughs> so we're now trying to get this uh, some protection. Other questions online? Uh, okay. okay. Anything else I can answer for you on the Just room? Just as, as a diver, I, yes. I hear conflicting yeah. uh, thoughts on this. Any particular colors that are more attractive? I mean, is black the color to wear to be less vulnerable or? Yeah, so there's a lot of questions about this idea of what do you wear? Uh, and the answer is a lot of shark species are, are colorblind, they're pretty close to it. But what they see is contrast. So if you are blending in with the environment, that can be good. Uh, shiny jewelry might look like a fish scale reflecting in the sunlight. Uh, around here, diving, like the shark can see from 100 feet away, so that won't be much of an issue, but in lower visibility, it, it might. I'll tell you that I, the wetsuit that I used for many years was hideous bright purple, and that is because it was the cheapest one at Divers Direct. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the only reason that factored into it. You ever bit? Nope, I've never been. Purple for me. Yeah, purple. Um, great. Today, I'm, I'm so excited to get to speak here. Thanks for watching at home. Um, I know some of you got a copy. I'll cut out here, and I'm happy to sign those for you. Um, and we have, do we have signature requests on the phone orders? Okay, great. I'll do those as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Go grab that pen again. And then I'll get to get. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, right here. Oh, no.